Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Our guest. Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Our guest today is Alqisa Ben. She is um a very known activist and she is going to tell us more about um her experience with COP28. So hi Balqis, how are you? Good. Hi Maisa. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you're doing great. I'm doing well, thank you. So um, I will start by introducing you at the beginning, and then I will ask you a few questions, okay? Okay, so Balqis Shaben is a peace and security practitioner and researcher, certified trainer and facilitator, youth engagement expert and program design specialist with five plus years of experience in the nonprofit sector. Balqis has worked with several organizations around the world, namely with the UN, IREX, USIP, World Youth Alliance, USAID, and many more. She has advanced experience in training on human rights and safe and effective activism, youth inclusive peace building and online engagement programs with an innovative approach in the Middle East and Africa. Her research interests include youth, lead, youth led peace building, social cohesion and change, human rights and dignity, WPS and YPS, and youth leadership with a proven ability to mentor young people globally. Balqis is fluent in three languages and currently holds several positions, working as a, as a program manager with the African Middle Eastern Leadership Project, Young Global Fellow in Foreign Policy with the Geneva Center for Security Policy, Project Officer with the Migration Youth and Children Platform, and as a youth researcher with USAID in Tunisia. Balqis has recently obtained her MA in International Affairs from the Lebanese American University in Lebanon. She is the recipient of two highly competitive and prestigious U.S. State Department scholarships, namely the Thomas Jefferson Undergraduate Scholarship Program and the MAPI Tomorrow Leaders Graduate Program. So from your, your bio, I can see that you've done some very amazing and impressive work throughout the years. And your work has been mostly about youth and about peace and security um, in the Middle East and Africa. Very impressive bio indeed. Thank you so much, Mesa. I'm sorry you had to read through all of that. <laughs> no, I am I am actually very impressed by your skills. Okay. So um I as I know, you attended COP28 recently in the UAE. And I want to ask you more about your experience there. Therefore, I've prepared a few questions for you. The first mm -hmm. one we will start with is, attending COP as a young person, how was your experience overall? Yeah, um, thank you so much for asking that. So I attended COP in Dubai as a representative of the um, the Migration Youth and Children Platform, which is basically the migration constituency of the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, and for me, it was my very first COP. Um, like you said, I'm a peace and security expert. So my background is more in peace and security than it is in climate, but obviously because of the nature of the world today, uh, because of the changing aspects of climate change, you cannot really separate both fields anymore. Um, so it was my first COP, like I said, um, my also very first big um, UN event. And I think overall, um, the experience I would say was overwhelming, to be honest, um, also a bit frustrating. I'm sure you saw my LinkedIn posts um, where I talked about how frustrating everything was. Um, if I really want to describe it quickly, I, I would say that as a youth champion, as a female, from the global south um, as a peace and security expert from a north african country um, which is tunisia that is now suffering from um, severely from the impact of climate change namely with water scarcity being one of them um, i really felt lost honestly at cop um, especially at the beginning because i expected more um i expected more youth integration and a lot of the work that was being done there and i didn't see that um, and that's also a point that I'll talk more about um, in a bit. But I wanted to sort of respond to this question in a more structured way because I don't want to rent on and on and on. Um, and I would say that COP was 
um, somehow successful in some ways, but also still majorly lacking a lot of change that we would have wanted to see. Um, and, you know, we hope to see at one of the biggest COPs that have ever been held up to date. COP28 actually had over 70,000 participants. Um, it was honestly really, really big, um, and it gathered a lot of civil society organizations, a lot of um, delegations, a lot of youth activists. Um, it was big in every sense of the way, and I think that's something that I personally thought would be a point of strength, um, you know, but honestly, it wasn't in so many cases. Um, to begin with, I would say the good things that happened there, again, from my background in peace and security and, you, you, you know, I, because of my work, I will always see things from that angle. As a peace and security uh, practitioner, I was happy that we had the first ever peace day. Uh, so the theme for December 3rd was actually peace. And I think that really signaled um, a clear uh, progress towards understanding the link between climate change and between peace and conflict. Um, we also, for the first time, um, we saw how much um, the link between conflict and peace, like I said, it was really strengthened in this COP compared to the past years. Um, conflict sensitivity is also a theme that a lot of people talked about, a lot of sessions were held on, a lot of panels tackled, um, and it was actually included in the very first draft uh, of the final agreement, although sadly, and the uh, final uh, draft, it was actually dropped, but conflict sensitivity, you know, in some way, at least it made it to the stage. Um, and conflict sensitivity is really important because we have seen as um, peace and security experts, we have seen firsthand the devastating impact of climate change on um, vulnerable communities that are undergoing war, that are in conflict. Um, if anything, I recently read that 70% of the climate vulnerable communities um, are actually at the risk of war or risk of any conflict. Um, we also saw the adoption of the historic loss and damage fund, which I'm sure you heard about, everyone did, it was all over the news. Um, there was the first ever also declaration um, on climate relief, recovery, and peace, uh, which again, from a peace background, that's a really big step. Um, and the biggest achievement that they talked about, which is um, choosing a language in the final uh, draft that very clearly stated the end, the beginning, which is what they call the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel um, era, where um, we had the first sighting of fossil fuels as, as um, the main route of climate crisis, which is something that has never happened um, before. So that clear, uh, that first sighting was actually really important, um, especially after almost 30 years of climate negotiations. Um, though the statement in itself the draft um, in itself was a bit ambiguous um a lot of experts disagreed with the language a lot of experts thought that it was very vague um and it was vague so that um you know it allows for certain federal states to continue the work that they're doing or lobbyists um fossil fuel lobbyists to also continue their work, uh, which apparently um, at COP, there was an overwhelming presence of fossil fuel lobbyists. Um, so this is one of the things I really wanted to highlight. Um, and, you know, I'm not really the first person to say that. I think um, if you just do like a go quick Google research, you'll see that there was a lot of opposition to a lot of things that were happening at COP. Um, especially the fact that um, the lack of a very um, an ambiguous statement when it comes to the end of fossil fuel, because what happened was that we need to transition, as everyone probably knows, we need to transition from the fossil fuel era urgently, because, um, you know, the rate at which the climate um, is getting worse and deteriorating is way quicker than the rate um, at which we're responding. And so we can no longer afford to be at the beginning of the, of the end. We need to be at the end of the fossil fuel um, era, which is something I think a lot of activists expected to see um, in the final draft, but sadly it wasn't the case. Um, and a lot of climate experts said that um, the lack of a clear statement of um, about how urgent it is to move away 
from fossil fuels is actually um it's it's a statement that is signals a tragedy for our planet and our future um and it is something like i said that is urgent that we can truly no longer ignore today um so the agreement also the final agreement had a lot of loopholes um to be honest it did not like i said it did not match the severity of the climate emergency um i saw personally on social media there was a huge outrage um when the final agreement was adopted um a lot of activists thought that it did not speak up to how urgent the situation is right now in a lot of countries, how urgent it is for us to move away, like I said, from fossil fuels. Um, I actually recently read um, a statement by Dr. Otto, who is a climatologist um, at Imperial College London, and he said that until fossil fuels are phased out, the world will continue to become a more dangerous, more expensive, and more uncertain place to live. Um, and I think this really, you know, puts it the best way possible. I couldn't have said it better. We need to move away from fossil fuels, but we haven't seen that yet. Um, we also, you know, something else that I wanted to highlight was the fact that I personally felt like um, the declaration, no matter how at least some people consider it to be historic. Um, it needs to be matched by implementation. We need like real, tangible, and material action, enough promises. Um, and I saw recently that Alert um, International, they uh, published a really nice reflection that I encourage everyone to read um, on, on uh, COP28. And they reflected how you know, where there is a need for coming together and pushing the international community to open their eyes and understand that, um, you know, climate, including climate finance, is connected to people and the specific context that they live in. And by that, they're talking about climate sensitivity and they're talking about conflict sensitivity and they're talking about the need um, because we saw a lot of um, pledges for increase in funding at COP28 and funding and climate finance is one of the biggest problems and obstacles that we have out there in tackling um, climate change. But um, even climate finance and even climate funding, when we have it, it needs to understand the context of the people and the um, specific specificities of where they live. So conflict sensitivity, again, is an important point. Um, and like I said at the beginning, there was at least for me, from my point of view, there was a huge lack of um, youth engagement. Um, and even if there was some sort of youth engagement, it felt as those, you know, tokenistic, not really engaging youth in decision-making sort of efforts. Um, I remember, I think it was at the Youth and Children Pavilion where the negotiations were happening behind closed doors. And I know that a lot of objection was happening to them because we had a lot of, um, the, you know, there were a few updates coming out um, now and then. And I remember I saw so many events at the Climate and Children Pavilion. And I thought, and I stood there literally in the middle of it. And I think they probably saw like a weird person who, who was feeling lost, just standing in the middle and observing everyone. But I really was, and I was looking at everyone and at the events. And to me, I felt uh, frustrated because I felt like we were being distracted through all of these um, panels and events that were happening, which don't get me wrong, they're great. And they really gathered a lot of amazing input. And I think um, the Children and Youth Pavilion is probably the best pavilion I've been to, um, along with the climate mobility one. But it felt like we were being distracted. Um, and it felt like the real decision making was happening behind closed doors. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, representation of women also, it was there, but not as the, at the rate that we wanted it to be. And I think, uh, um, I mean, I don't want to continue talking for too long, but I think overall, um, yeah, it, I personally wouldn't call it a success. I think there is, it, it, if anything, it showed us that we are, there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Um, and personally, it left me really frustrated uh, thinking about ways, you know, we can progress better than the rate we're progressing at right now. Because at the end of the day, and I said this in one of my LinkedIn posts, technically, we will outlive the generation that is now making the decisions and we will outlive the policymakers. And that is our future. This is going to be the future where 
um, of, of young people my age and your age where we will have to be the ones living through the worst um, consequences of climate change. And so it's technically and quite literally actually affecting us. And I think that in itself should be one of the main reasons why we should be at the decision making uh, table. Very interesting experience, Balkis. I noticed how you talked about several things about COP, what you liked and what you didn't like. Very interesting indeed. Um, but one thing I want to point out is the fact that you mentioned how there is a lack of youth representation in your answer. So could you please share more thoughts about that and tell me more about it? Yeah. Um... So um, as a youth champion and as a youth engagement expert, and even as a peace and security expert, and as a North African female, um, I always happen, and I say this out loud, I happen to have a bias to my region, which is the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and in what, whatever space I go to, especially in big conferences like COP, where um, you know being there actually does matter, despite how maybe these spaces feel um, marginalizing or how much these spaces feel like they're systematically pushing us to the periphery, um, I think it's important to be there. So I always try to find youth from my region, youth from the Middle East, youth, youth from North Africa who were, you know, besides the delegation that was sent, the young delegation as negotiators, I look for young people who are doing different types of work, who come from my region and who are there. but. Um, Specifically at COP, I noticed a huge lack of that, to be honest. Um, I think we had about, I the youth I met and the youth I talked to were very, I would say like four or five people from the Middle East, young people from the Middle East, who, when I talked to them, they were super excited that they were there in the first place. And they were telling me that, look, there's a person from Jordan, and there was a person from Egypt, and there are a few from Tunisia. And I'm like... That's true, but think of it technically, we're very few compared to the number of other young people, right? It, like, I, I would consider that a win, but no, it's actually not. And when I talk to these young people about why do they think or do they know a person who wanted to come and who couldn't or who's doing climate work and they couldn't, and they told me they know many, but they're not there because of the lack of funding, which is a big, big, big problem. They weren't there because they couldn't get badges uh, to the blue zone, which is basically... Uh, giving you access to the zone where the negotiations and, you know, the more important events are happening, um, or they have passports that they cannot travel with, um, sadly. And I think, um, yeah, I, I was really frustrated. I thought with 70,000 participants, I'll see more representation of Arab youth, of youth from um, conflict areas. Um, you know, if anything, I think from Sudan, for example, I only saw two who told me how difficult it was for them to get the COP in the first place, you know, and to be able to travel. Um, yeah, so like I said, in the Youth and Children Pavilion, which was an amazing, amazing space, um, I really felt like we were distracted and I felt like we were marginalized in a sense that it was more of like, there you go, we gave you space, do your thing, but the real decision making and negotiations are happening. They're going to happen behind closed doors, security closed doors. Um, they're going to come up with a, um, a declaration at the end that will affect your future, but you have very little say in it. Um, and that's the thing that really, really frustrated me. Um, it's the fact that even you know, in a space like COP, where personally I expected more engagement, a space that was really, really big because COP was held at uh, Expo 22 Dubai, um, Expo 20, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, Dubai, you know, you, I just, it felt like it was stuck in a stick, like I said. Um, a lot of consultations actually before COP happened. Um, a lot of young people were invited to sit at tables to give their opinion. But I think right now, as a youth engagement expert, I think right now the problem isn't consultations. Um, the problem is that we no longer need to only take the opinion of young people. That is not enough. It's not enough anymore. It used to be before, right? When you were still talking about the beginning of the engagement of youth. But right now we need more than that. And we need to demand more than that. Um, I remember I attended um, 
a talk about youth peace and security, which is my area of, of research. Um, and I listened to a lot of speeches by heads of big UN agencies, by representatives of youth. Um, and it really, it felt like we were listening to the same speech that we listen to every time, where we talk about how important it is to engage youth. And we talk about the need to have uh, more young people sit at the decision-making table. And we recognize and we acknowledge the need to better support youth um, in finding responses to climate change. But that's it. Right. That's what it happens when when the event finished. I remember thinking to myself, OK, now what? Right. Like, thank you for sitting at the table and telling me that it is important to engage me and tell me that you're aware of it. But what are you doing to respond to that? How how are you turning your speech into action? Right. Thank you for meeting up with me. Thank you for taking photos with me. But that that is not enough. It is not enough for young people to sit with an ambassador at a table and tell them about their issues and that their country is going through and then walk away, right? We need to see real implementation um, of these promises. We need to see, um, just like pledging money, I think something people need to realize that pledging money doesn't mean, doesn't literally translate to financing. It means someone is promising you to give you money, but whether that actually happens, whether the money is actually transferred at the end or not, that is a different story. So same thing with these speeches, right? And same thing with these 15 minute, 30 minute, even one hour meetings that we do with big UN officials, with governmental heads, with people who are actually in power, who are actually influencing decision making and policy making. Um, you know, for me, enough talking. Please start showing us that you're actually implementing the things that you're promising. So yeah, it just felt like a lot of that. It felt like it's a lot of um, you know, where we, I will always say that this, um, we watch the table, but we're not really at the table. So we get close enough. It feels like we get close enough to the decision-making table, but we never actually sit at it. So I think unless we get to sit there and unless we tend to speak, we get to speak up. I don't think, um, I don't think a lot of change would happen. And going back again to the point of young people, um, uh, from the Middle East and Africa, um, yeah, I think that was the most frustrating thing for me is to find one or two people representing each country while in different regions, you would find delegations of 20 and 25 people. So yes, it is great that we're there. Yes, it is great that we were able to kind of surpass these financial obstacles, um, you know, the issue of the passport as well, but it is not enough, right? It is sad to... For me, at least, it was sad to see that, I don't know, I had to look all over to find one or two people who spoke my language or who came from my region. Um, and just on a final point, um, you know, I, I sat actually at the panel with uh, FAO and IOM, and they asked the question of engaging youth and how to better support youth. And one thing I highlighted there, and I really want to highlight here is that you know, engagement and even consultancies, which a lot we're seeing a lot of, again, we're seeing a lot of consulting, even now in preparation for CSW, the Convention of the Status of Women um, that's happening in New York in March. We're seeing a lot of consultations online. I'm being invited to a lot of consultations online, but I'm also honestly getting tired of it. I'm getting tired of providing my opinion so that later on might not actually even be implemented. That's a whole different issue that we can talk about. And also just tired of generally just giving my opinion. But anyway, so um, at the panel, I highlighted something. It is the fact that when you want to better engage youth, especially youth coming to that space at COP28, you need to realize that we are the privileged ones. We are the ones who are able to travel. We are the ones who are able to get a badge. We are the ones who are able to participate. There are There is a way bigger number of young people in rural areas, in my country, for example, or in, or in Middle Eastern countries who are, first of all, most impacted by the uh, impact of climate change. They are most uh, vulnerable, and they are the ones who you need to talk to. So they, the people, the thing is that the young people who are not at the table because they couldn't make it are the ones that you need to consult. So don't talk to us. 
go to rural areas, talk to the more vulnerable youth, talk to the youth who have a lot to say because they're suffering most from it and they're most affected by it. And those are the youth that you need to talk, that you need to, talk to. So I think, yeah, even in how, engage, how they need to engage youth and um, even which youth group to talk to, I think that's a whole different issue. So yeah, there's a lot, but I'll stop here. Very interesting. And that would take me to my next question to you, which is what message would you give to these young people, those who managed to attend COP28 in person and also those who were unable to attend? Yeah. Um, so I would definitely continue. continue um, I would urge youth to continue the work that they're doing. I would urge youth not to give up. I think in preparation for um, COP29, um, which will be happening in Baku, I think um, we need to do better work. We need to engage more. We need to pressure the international community more. We need to talk to our own representatives. We need to engage in more ways in that space. Um, and we need really to include the youth who are not able to make it um, in the short term, or even in the long term. Those are the youth that I mean, we need to talk to. And I really encourage young people to speak up. A lot of them, when I had, um, I talked to a lot of youth about how, you know, I, I actually asked a lot of youth at COP28, do you feel included in what's happening? And many of them said no. And they proceeded to tell me that even though they don't feel included, they don't know how to respond to that. Like many of them were like, what do we do? Right. And one thing that youth really can do, and I know this is always underestimated, is to continue to speak up, right, to never give up, because the more advocacy work you do, the more you speak up, the more you highlight how you feel marginalized with time that will add pressure and also with the number of young people speaking up that will add pressure so please don't give up uh, please continue asking for inclusive youth engagement please continue um, making sure that you're not only representing your community you're also representing other young people from different other vulnerable communities who cannot you know participate we don't even have the internet connection or a laptop because they're in very remote areas those are the youth that need help the most um, and I think, you know, we need to understand that we are also representing everyone. So we need to take that responsibility very seriously. Um, and we need to make sure that for COP29, with the small yet maybe significant progress that has been made in COP28, we need to continue advocating for what we started and to continue to push peace to be on the table, conflict sensitivity, understanding the link between climate and conflict, um, especially with everything happening in uh, Gaza right now. So yeah, um, I would just encourage you really not to give up. Powerful message, um, Balqis, and thank you very much for very insightful and very interesting points of view that you mentioned, especially for you as a young person and as someone from the Middle East and North Africa who attended COP28, um, COP that was happening in an Arab country. Um, it was very mm -hmm. interesting to hear the lack of youth representation and the lack of representation of people from Arab countries and from the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so thank you very much, Balqis. It was a very interesting discussion. So Balqis, um, to repeat again, she is a peace and security practitioner and researcher, certified trainer and facilitator, youth engagement expert and program design specialist. So thank you very much, Balqis, for the very insightful and very interesting points of discussion. Thank you, Maisa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great day.